All right, thank you all so much. And I feel far away from you, but my job this evening, I hope this evening will feel like we've all come together into one space. And in order to do that, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna bring you into boy world. So, how many people here have a seventh grade boy? Can you raise your hand so I can see you? Okay, so you might know, you might know and will be able to relate to the story I'm gonna tell you. But for the men in the audience, I want you to remember what it was like when you were in seventh grade. I really want you to do that. I want you to remember what it was like when you were in seventh grade. And now I'm gonna tell a story. So you have a seventh grade son. And he is invited to a swim party by his good friends. Like so all of his friends, his good friends are gonna be there. And a couple of weeks before the swim party, he says to you really casually, I need you to get me a swim shirt. But he doesn't say it in a particular, for a particular reason. He does not tie this to the swim party. So you very understandably put it in your head, okay, the next time I see a swim shirt when I'm doing the other 5,000 things I have to do, I'm gonna pick up that swim shirt. So you don't pick up the swim shirt in time for the party. The day of the party arrives. You can't find your son. It is time to go. So you do, you, you know, you call him and you say, let's say his name is John, and you say, John, time to go to the party. You know, that reasonable tone of voice that parents have when we're not irritated at our children. <laughs> and then there's no answer. So you say it again, John, time to go to the party. No answer. So you get a little irritated. So then you go up to the place where you think he most likely will be, and in fact, there he is. He has, he has one with the couch, and he is playing a video game. And he is completely tuned out. There is no swimsuit near him. There is no towel. There is no plan, as far as you can tell, that this boy is attending, about to go to his swim party. So you say to him, you have to go to this party. And you think you want to go to this party. Your friends are at this party. So clearly, the reason that you are having a problem is because you are addicted to video games and you are not respecting the screen time rules that we have talked about. <laughs> now, you leave to go get your stuff. You come back a few minutes later and that child has not moved from the couch. And you are out of your mind with irritation. So you turn off the, you turn off the, um, you know, you turn off the screen. He says, he's like, no, no, let me just wait this one. Let me just get to the next level. Let me just like throw myself off this cliff. Let me just kill myself. Just wait. I just need to get to this next level. And you say, I don't care, or some version of that. And you turn it off, and he is absolutely a pill. So then you get into the car, and you bring the present that you have remembered and you have purchased for this child, for this birthday child, for this party, and you get into the car. You drive to the party, and he is totally sullen. And you are thinking two things. I have an ungrateful brat for a child. And two, he is addicted to video games, and violent video games, and maybe. And he is not recognizing or respecting my screen time rules. <laughs> you drop him off at the party. Totally like, thanks. You're know, like, thanks. Gets it, goes away. Three hours later, you come back to the party to pick him up, and you are determined to start fresh. You are not going to be in a bad mood. You are going to be in a good mood. You are going to change the dynamic. He gets in the car, and because you're in a good mood, you say, how was the party? He says, fine. And you say, who was there? And he says, some kids from school. And you are back to, in two seconds, being as irritated as you were before. Then you get home. He walks right back up to the screen that he left, turns it back on, and chooses the most violent video game that you have, and starts blowing people up, and he is happy about it. And you think your child really has a problem because he's addicted to video games. Okay. But here's what you don't know. What you don't know is that even though your son is good friends with all these boys, and has maybe grown up with these boys, and you are friends with the parents of these boys, is that one of them, for the last six months, has been calling him Boob Boy, and has been teasing him about having moves, man boobs. 
And during the party, when your son, because he didn't have a swim shirt, because you didn't get it for him, even though I didn't tell you that he actually needed it for the party, he got out of the pool, and the boy that's been teasing him convinced another kid in the group, again, his friend, to take a picture of your son and forward it to everybody else in the grade. So now it's gonna be all over, and they're gonna put a little thing about boo boy or boo boy, and your son is so angry. Now while this happened, there was one kid who didn't like it and swam away and pretended it wasn't happening. And another guy laughed and tried to make a joke and tried to smooth things over, but the result was is that he was really embarrassed about something that he is personally humiliated about. And he comes home and he's got, he is so incredibly frustrated and he is frustrated for the very, these reasons. He is frustrated, he's ashamed, excuse me, because he feels deeply, deeply embarrassed about his body. But he has no language to talk about it because he's a boy. He doesn't think there's any point in talking to his friends because that will only make it worse. But he doesn't know what to do and he is furious at this kid for making him miserable. He also doesn't want to tell you. Because you know what happens if you find out or he tells you? You might do something. <laughs> and he doesn't want you to do anything. Because that might involve calling up the parents and telling them, do you know what your child is doing? And you might not. It might be super, super awkward because these people are friends of yours, so it might take you a while to figure out what to do. But at the very least, your son does not want you to know what's going on. And the other part is, is that he is deeply wired to believe that asking an adult for help is a sign of weakness, and it is deeply embarrassing. So all of these things are happening, but you as a well-meaning parent can understandably completely misread what's going on and see this as, my child does not respect his screen time, and he is turning into a violent addict of video games. So we are misreading signs that are right in front of us about boys. So one of the things I want to really challenge people about, and one of the things I would love walking out of here tonight, is that you, you never, if we ever, ever hear boys are simple, they just fight and it's over, that we stop that here and now. Because boys have extremely complex lives. In fact, they're so complex that we cannot see them. So it is one of the things I'm here to do tonight is to really start a conversation about how we talk about boys, and how we talk to boys, and how we have boys talk to us. So that's what my goal is tonight. Now how do we get here, and also, what can we, what can we do as parents and as people who care about boys to be able to break some of the things that I just talked about in those dynamics? Because look, it's not just your son that's part of this. These are his friends. Sometimes he loves his friends. Like, these are his good friends. But sometimes they make his life really difficult. And each kid plays a role. So it's not just about the target, it's also about the kid who knows what's going on and swims away. What if that's your child? What if you, like really think about this, what if it's your child in the swimming pool and your child sees something horribly embarrassing going on to somebody he cares about and he swims away? What if you see your kid laughing and joining in with that other kid who's tormenting the move, the move boy. So there's all different roles that, that come to play in boys' relationships and friendships. And yet, boys' friendships are extraordinarily important to them. So how, do we, how did I figure out, or how can we get past the really tough stuff of boys because they're so good at throwing up walls? Boys are excellent, excellent, excellent at basically saying, I will never tell you what's going on with me. So how do we get past that? Well, let me tell you, as somebody who has taught boys and girls for about 20 years, is that it was very clear to me for quite a while that I was not giving the answers that boys needed. And I needed to do better because boys deserved more. So what I did was I stopped. <coughs> and about two and a half years ago, I said to boys around the country, Help me understand your world. I care about it deeply. I want to know how to do it better. Help me understand your world. Help me understand why you're not talking to your folks. Help me understand what, what's going on with your friends. Help me understand why you're lying to your mother or your father. Help me understand why you're doing things 
that when we as adults find out about it, the thing that we say is, why in the world did you think that was a good idea? So help me understand this. This is what happened. I went to schools and said, give me like some students. Not your like students that look good and you, when you have gas, you want to have that meet these boys. I want those boys. I want all different kinds of boys. I want the tormentor. I want the kid who serves away. I want the kid who's being tormented. I want all different kinds of kids. And I want them from all over the country. So very quickly, we had about, uh, we had many schools, about half dozen schools, that were giving me groups of kids that I would meet with on a regular basis, like every quarter. And it was, they were in New Orleans, they were in uh, Massachusetts, they were in the South, they were in California, they were in Louisville, Kentucky, they were everywhere. But what also happened is that when I was doing my presentations to middle school and high school kids, I would say to them after the presentations, so there's this project I'm doing, how to explain it. I'm writing a book for parents and people who care about boys, about the social lives of boys, like what do we need to know? But I'm also writing another book. And I'm writing another book just for high school guys that, in like eighth grade and above. And this book is gonna be only an ebook. And if you are having a problem, like you all of a sudden, the, all of the girls in your grade have decided they hate you and they have ganged up on you, or what happens if you like really lie to your parents and they're about to find out, what happens if you make a huge mistake and you need to figure out how to make amends? What happens when you get pulled over by a police officer? What happens, I mean, all the different kinds of things that can happen to a boy, I'm gonna give you a guide. And that guide is the companion to this book. And it is for free, and anybody can download it, you can download it, but there's some rules that how, I will talk about this later, but how you talk to your son about this. Like, I do not want you, I'll say it again, I'll say it first time and I'll say it other times. I do not want, please, this is my, my I'm requesting. Please do not go to your son if you think this might be worthwhile and say, I found this book that I think would be really worthwhile. There's this woman who read this book for you. Please do not do this. Please do not do this. So I'm going to give you some instructions later about if you think it's worthwhile, then you can do this. But just put this in your head. Please do not do this. Okay. So we have these two books. And these boys worked with me. And it came to about 200 kids. They would come to me after the presentations and say, I'm gonna work on this. They would secretly, they would find out what was going on, they would find out my Twitter handle and they would tweet at me and say, I wanna work on it. There were three boys at a school in California that, both, that all three of them contacted me afterwards and they never knew until a month ago, this is two years, that all three of them had worked on this. And they were friends, they were, each of them were friends. They were friends with each other. So, we have a group of boys who do this, and then about a year into it, we had several high school girls, about 40, and one of them was at a school where I was working in Louisville, and we were doing a lot of stuff about hooking up, and sort of ethical rules of hooking up, and how you deal with this, this is for all the boys stuff, you know, the boys high school thing. Um, and I was cornered by a group of girls in a hallway, and I don't know if you've ever had that experience. I actually, some, I have had that experience many times in my life, and it's never pleasant. I always wonder what I've done wrong. I always sort of like, whoa, what am I in for? Oh boy, what have I done? And the girls very understandably said to me, you were talking to our friends about the stuff that's going on on the weekends, and we think that maybe we need to tell you the other side of the story. So then the girls started um, helping us out. So we have 200 kids who helped for two years for no other reason than they wanted to help you and they wanted to help your sons. That they believed that what they were doing was larger than themselves and they wanted to contribute and they felt that this was an important thing to do. So I am basically an ambassador of those boys and some of those girls who work so hard. That's what both of these books do. And there is not one page in this book that is not had kids look at it and say, oh, right there, you gotta get that out, that's super annoying. Right, that advice you just gave, totally counterproductive. I hate that when my mother says that to me. So, we vetted it time and time again. So these are not books. If you don't buy this book, fine. The, the other one's free. What this really is, is I'm asking to change the conversation that we have about boys. So this is a movement about changing the way that we think about boys, we experience boys, and we allow them to come into their full potential. The reason is because for a long time, 
And we still have a lot to do for girls in this world. Goodness knows we do. They get very counterproductive messages in the culture in all different kinds of ways. But what girls do have is a language to be able to talk about their emotional experiences. And there are people who support them being able to claim their passion, to be able to say, I want to make the world a better place. That we have a language and we have a support system for girls to do that. We do not, in any way comparably, have that same support system for boys. Nor do we have that language. And I'm not talking about having boys sit in a circle and talk about their innermost feelings. That is not, I don't know, that doesn't work really with anybody, frankly. Like, who wants to sit in a circle with somebody who's looking at you, expecting you to say all of your innermost feelings, and you're supposed to do that? I'm a girl. I never like doing that. But boys are really not going to like doing that. So this is about being able to get the boys to communicate and tell us about their lives in ways that work for them. All right. So that's what we're here for tonight. Here's the way I want to start you thinking about boys. There are four concepts that I think, no matter what, you are male, you are female, no matter how old you are, if you're a student, if you're a teacher, there are four concepts that I think make us feel good, that make us feel happy. So these are what these four things are. One is that you have meaning beyond oneself in your life. So the boys are working for you, writing these books, this is meaning beyond oneself. You have a hope of success. I'll use the book example again. When I came to the boys, they had no idea whether this was really going to turn into a book. They didn't know. They had a hope of success. They didn't know that it was going to become a New York Times bestseller. They did not know. They had a hope of success. They don't know if people are going to agree with it or not. It was no guarantee. It was a hope. Social connection. Social connection is what is inherently important and essential to all of us, that we are connected to others. And that we are doing satisfying work. So when I work in schools, one of the things I think is incredibly important and helpful for me as an educator is to think about school having these four things as their pillars. But for anybody, this is super helpful. Of like, what is it that's going to make me feel like I should get up every day? Now, the problem or the conflict or the reality is that conflict is absolutely inevitable with all these people. So you have all, this is all about having connection with people and talking to people and working with people. And it is inevitable that you will get into conflict with people. And it is inevitable that you will see an abuse of power. Somehow you will witness somebody abusing power against somebody else. It will happen to you. Or you might be the person who's abusing power. So those two things are inevitable. And what my work is about, again, male or female with my students, is two central concepts that are undergirded by this. One is that dignity is not negotiable, that everyone has the right to be inherently worthy. Everyone does, you just get it. But the other is, is that you are socially competent. So if you're thinking about conflict, even including bullying, is that what we want to do throughout the process is teach children to be socially competent, with a bedrock concept of dignity is not, is not negotiable for your child or for anybody else, including, by the way, you. So when we put those things together, what we've got is mess. We've got our goal of what makes us meaningful, and at the same time, what we've got is life is really messy, and people get into conflicts, and they get really angry, and they don't know how to deal with it, and our culture gives us very prescribed rules, both for boys and girls, about how you're allowed to express that anger. So in our culture, a lot of times what we're get, boys are getting is you either say nothing or you step up to somebody physically. There's not a lot of room in the middle for how you speak truth to power in a way that is credible. That is another thing that we're trying to do. So within this and within these conflicts, you're going to go to school. And school is one of the ways that you are always going to, have a, going to experience social dynamics and conflicts. And you're also going to learn in school how adults behave when they see an abuse of power. So when a principal or a, or a vice principal walks down, the, or a teacher or a counselor walks down the hallway and they see something off, or they see somebody being abusive to another person, 
Do they stick, speak to it? Do they speak to it effectively? Do they condone the behavior? All of these things we learn in school, besides math and science and all of that, is we learn the fundamentals of how people behave in groups. Now I'm going to show you a snapshot, going back to the Swift party, of what's going on with the boys in the roles. So some boys, not all boys, some boys have an inner circle group of friends. And that usually is made up of about five guys, maybe eight, it can be up to about eight. This is all coming, by the way, as I'm speaking, from the boys who helped me with the project. So there are different positions that the boys will take, and those positions, though, are not things that will be constantly stuck on a kid always. So I'm going to show you these, but I want you to think of them as like labels in a moment. And then you can be a little bit of different things. But if, you, if you're able to get clear about what kind of roles people play, then you can have an understanding of their behavior. And then if there's a problem with it, then you can transform it. So here's my first one, the mastermind. One of the titles of the book. So a mastermind is the kid who has a lot of social control. So he directs the group's movements. He tells them where to go. When they're done with lunch, he's the one that gets up first. When he decides they're gonna go over and play this, he decides. He is the person who, who directs the group's movements. He gives ultimate approval to friends about everything, from sneaker choice, like you know, what are you wearing? Clothing choice, style choice, what is a sport that is an acceptable sport to play? Who are the girls that you perceive to be hot? How heterosexist are you going to be, if at all? Um, it's going, there's political choices, like who you should vote for for the presidential election. This boy decides what the other boys are going to decide. What video games to play. That's an excellent, excellent demonstration of power. Who's going to go first? Also, very important, not just for kids who are 10, but for kids who are 17. Now, the tricky thing for me and for people I think who work with kids is that you're never quite sure how intelligent this kid is until his power is threatened, especially when an adult is, adult is, is threatening his power. So I want you to think about that because it's really tough. I have often had experiences where a kid will do something extraordinarily Machiavellianly genius, and my first reaction to it for years has been, there's no way that kid did that. He's not smart enough. And then I realized, researching for this book, that in fact, that is the key. He just looks like he's not smart enough. But he's actually really brilliant. Now, this is not all bad. Okay, you might look at this and think, okay, Machiavelli. Machiavelli, by the way, was not all bad. Let's just be clear. But it's really important not to think, oh my gosh, this is all horrible. For example, this kid is a great protector of other boys in the group. He's really charismatic. He can be really fun to be around. So there's lots of good things about this kid. The next role is the associate. He gathers information. He's the information gatherer. So I want you to picture five boys on a couch. And he is the one with the phone, and he's getting the information because he is the social point person. So for those of you who have high school boys, again, molded into the couch, and he's hitting the text about where the parties are, and then the mastermind decides which party they're going to go to. He does have the best ability to stand up to the mastermind, and he can do it in ways that are subtle. Like that, and you know, sometimes what boys will say, the associate will say things like, don't worry about it, man, it's not worth it. Does that sound familiar? So these are the ways of like, you don't have to compromise your masculinity, the appearance of your masculinity at this moment, I'm going to get you away. And he can also be um, like a social lubricant for, for the group with other groups. A bouncer. Cannot read people's motivations, struggles academically, and takes the fall for the associate and the mastermind. Because what he does is he perceives loyalty to his friends as being that he should back them up no matter what they are doing. So he's not seeing that sometimes what they're doing is manipulating the concept of loyalty for him to take the fall. So this is something that actually the boys are quite able to recognize amongst the group. Now again, the boys are the people who came up with all of the names for this. Next is the fly. The fly builds his friendships by buying or bragging. If he has parents 
who are insecure about his social status and want him to have friends and want him to have certain friends with nice families, then they're going to do things. And it, it does. It's well-meaning. It comes from a good place. I Meaning we want our son to have friends. We want him to, this is where it gets a little nutsy. We want him to have certain friends because they look good for various reasons. Um, and we're going to do this by doing, like, for example, we're going to have a party or there'll be a concert and they'll, the tickets will be incredibly expensive or a sports thing and the tickets are incredibly expensive and they will let this kid bring, like, four kids. Now, what's really clear from the boys is they don't really like this kid that much. Like, he's okay, but they don't like him. And here's the reason, is he hovers outside the group and other boys have no guilt excluding him because they think he's irritating. Now again, I'm going to say this, because I think sometimes people look at this and go, this is terrible, right? This is not a good place to be. I 100% absolutely will agree if you're thinking this, not good. But this does not have to last on this kid forever. If parents calm down about trying to manage their kids' social situations, wanting them to be with like sort of high social status kids, this will stop. Your child will much more easily see that friendships should be authentic and they're not bought. So there are really opportunities here to get this to not be this way. And I've seen it time and time again. The entertainer. This is a kid that, that is easy to like. So he's obnoxious, but he's not mean. He's good at making people feel comfortable. So I want you to think about the swim party. So the entertainer saw what was happening, knows that it's not good. He got that feeling in his stomach. And he said something, maybe he made a joke against himself. Maybe he did something to distract the mastermind. So he was doing something to be able to make it feel better. So he's good at being able to make people feel comfortable or trying to do that. The other problem, the, the, one of the challenges that you might have if you have this child in your house or in your classroom is that he never stops talking. So, you know, he can do a right? But he really, really can have a hard time turning himself off. Okay, here's another one, the punching bag. And I'm going to tell this to you, I did not know these things before I started this. And I've been working with kids for a long time. The boys are the people that identify these roles. The punching bag is an easy target amongst the boys, the, the inner circle. And the inner circle believes that they can treat him badly. And the reason why is this classic thing of, that we usually apply to our siblings that I can say whatever I want to my siblings, I can do whatever I want to my siblings, but nobody else better say something bad about them. The boys apply the same concept to them. Like, we can totally humiliate him, we can totally embarrass him, but he's, he's our boy, we love him. Nobody can talk to him the way we do. And because these friendships are like not all negative, they're powerful, these boys love each other, Many they love hanging out with each other. There is nothing better than sitting on that couch, molding into it, and going after each other and eating Doritos. There is nothing better. So these people are important to him. So if you see what's going on with him and he's not being treated well, he's going to defend his friends because it's not all bad. And this kid, by the way, is a really good listener. I mean, I, there, was, there was a kid in particular in the group, he was a senior, wonderful kid, um, went to a great school on a soccer scholarship, did really well in school, and his parents had no clue that he was the punching bag of his group. All the other boys knew it. He was ruthlessly ridiculed. And what was so, what was so clear to me was that you could go and talk to him. If you were having a problem, he'd be a great person to talk to. He might not be able to do anything about it, but he would be a good listening for it. He'd be a, a good sounding for it. Now, here's one, here's one more, the conscience. The conscience is one that I think a lot of parents are like, you see this, you're like, that, I want that as my kid, that is my kid, <laughs> right? <laughs> Not, we'll just hold on a second. <laughs> so here's the deal. The conscience worries about rules and consequences. He stresses about this. So when the other boys are about to do something incredibly stupid to him, he worries about it. The problem is he might say something bad to them, which the boys don't really want to hear. So that is the reason why sometimes they exclude him, because it's like having a chaperone. But sometimes it's good to have him around. Sometimes it's really strategic to have him around. And that is when they need him to talk to adults. So 
He is sometimes used by the group as a screen. In fact, some of the boys in my group said to me that if they wanted to do something that they knew their mother was not going to let them do, they would say, well, John, i.e. the conscience, was going to be there. And then the mom would say, oh, well, if John's going to be there, then it's fine. <laughs> so you, you just need to use his name and parents will calm down. So think about that because your children are not dumb and they're using these names on purpose. Do you really think they're going to tell you if they're going to go out with some kid that you hate? No. They're going to say, I'm going out with this kid. And you're going to say, awesome, I love that kid. Right? <laughs> right? All right. So the conscience is a little bit tricky, too. And he will lie to pick to parents. He will. He'll feel bad about it, but he will lie. Because, he, because his loyalty is to his friends. And the other part is they don't like, you know, it's a little bit hard because you're known as the conscience. You're known as the guy, sort of the uptight guy. So you got to lie. You can't not lie to the parents sometimes because then you're really uptight, right? It's like you feel bad about it, but you gotta, you got to you gotta help your friends out sometimes. Now, there's one more position in the group or in, amongst the boys, and that could be somebody that I call the champion. Now, hold. This is a kid who is able to hold their own and be able to uh, uh, communicate their boundaries, their values, and they're pretty good at being the moral compass, at, at being their own moral compass. First of all, let me tell you that that's a lonely place to be. It can be. But the other thing that I think is much more effective when we're talking to boys and girls, but particularly salient for boys, is that you don't want to walk around being like the champion, because that's weird. You don't want to have like a plaque on you that says, I'm the champion. <laughs> what I would much rather do and ask us to think about for both boys and for girls is that in moments of social injustice, no matter, that is age appropriate to your child, that they see that moment of social injustice as the moment to step forward and speak their truth, and speak their truth to power. Because I think much more importantly than these are the labels and here's what, here's what my kid is, because I really strongly want you to think about it in more of a generalized way, is that in these situations my child is more likely to act X way. But that any moment of abuse of power that your child says to themselves, this is the moment that I step in, that is when they are a champion. So go back to the swim party. Because that's where all this conflict, what is going to happen? How is your son going to handle this? Oh, and by the way, you know what maybe that the mastermind did? God forbid your son has a crush on a girl. So the mastermind knows because he got it from the associate who has everybody's numbers and information, and he sends it to the girl that he has a crush on. Okay? Now, let me just hone on in on this just very, very briefly. We've been talking about girls and body image for a very long time. And so it's gonna be it's gonna be Halloween in about six weeks, right? Yeah. And parents, when you buy your girls' Halloween costumes, you are going to think about, you're probably not going to buy the sexiest costume that you can get for your daughter. And people, I mean, right about this time of year, I start to get, I get emails from moms at various times during the year. Right when they're buying swimsuits for their daughters, I get, oh my gosh, I just went and tried to buy my daughter, a six-year-old, seven-year-old, eight-year-old daughter, a bathing suit without a padded bra. What is going on in this world? It's gonna, it also happens again right around Halloween. But you're thinking about it. When you buy a Halloween costume that's a superhero for your son, and it has a six-pack sewn into it, do you think about it? Not many parents do. That's what our sons are dealing with. Our sons are dealing with body image issues that are just as pervasive to them as it is for girls, but they do not have a language, nor do they usually have adults who are thinking about it and protesting it in the larger culture. We just get them that Spider-Man or Batman costume, and by the way, those co you know the images of Batman are getting more and more and more ripped and more sullen as the years go by. I love, love, for many reasons, the Batman movies, love them. But it is absolutely, you can't argue the fact that as superheroes get, except for Iron Man, right, when he's out of it, <laughs> is that those guys are ripped. And that impacts our boys just like it does our girls. 
So what are we going to do? How are we going to get the kids, the boys, to talk to us? And in many ways, I really want you to think about this in terms of this works for boys and girls pretty equally. Or just as effectively, I say that. It's just that boys are just, can be such walls. So here's the quintessential moment for boys, right? They get into the car, and you ask how their day was, and they say, fine. How was school? Fine. It was good. That's all you get. Anything more, they look at you like you are absolutely the most boring, tedious person in the entire world. They get their earbuds, or they pretend to fall asleep, or they roll their eyes, and there you're feeling like, I just would like to get a little information out of you. I would just like to know a little bit about your dad. Is it so much to ask to get a little bit of information from you? All right, you can. But here's the thing, we're gonna use the swim party as like our anchor. And we can do this for all different ages. We want our sons to come to us when there's a conflict. We want them to see that asking for help can be a capacity, it's a skill, and that everybody can be in situations at some point in their lives that are overwhelming, and it's not a sign of weakness to ask for help. So how do we get there? I want you to go back to the moment when you see your child for the first time, like at the end of the day, or when you pick them up after practice. So here's what happened. You get in, the kid gets in the car, and this is what he hears. So, how was school? How was your day? Did you do your grades? Did you turn that in? Did you talk to your teacher? Why didn't you talk to your teacher? Did you fill out that stuff that you were supposed to fill out? Well, what was food like today? Did you do your allergies? Did you do your medicine? How's that going? Um, was that food nice to you? All of these questions, and your kid is like, are you kidding me? Are you kidding me with this? And what boys have very clearly said to me is, I want you to really imagine, like imagine, if my parent walks in from a hard day of work and my reaction to my parent is, so, how was the meeting? Did you talk to that person that you hate and totally undermines you every single time you see? What did you do about it? You didn't talk to them? What's the problem? Did you answer all of your emails today? Why not? Well, don't you think you better do it right now? Now, I'm going to apologize on behalf of like experts around the country because we have been saying to you, as soon as you get your child in the car, start talking to them, start asking them questions. And I did not realize something so extraordinarily obvious, which is they are trapped in the car. They don't like it. So, what I would like for you to do, these are all suggestions. And I've also tried them all, I've tried all of these things out on my own children. I have to tell you, I have these two boys, they're 10 and 12. And writing this book has been great because it's helped me with my own parenting. Plus, the other part is, I actually, a lot of times, I like hanging out with like other people's boys sometimes more than my own. Because they're nice for me, right? Those other boys are nice for me, they think I'm not stupid, they think they don't roll their eyes very rarely up roll their eyes at me, they think my jokes are funny, I mean, really they pretend they do. So it's nice hanging out with other your it's really nice hanging out with other people's sons. My children, it's a crapshoot. So it did really help me be able to talk to my own son. So your son gets into the car, and you say something like, hey, what's up? That's it. You say, you want to put some music on? And you get to veto, by the way, whatever. If, you, if there's some music that's highly irritating to you, you get to veto the music, right? But you get to come with a compromise of like, music that you want to listen to. But you just do that. You just hang out. You just drive. Be silent. It's really great to be silent. Let your child be silent. If you have a good relationship with your son, he wants to relax when he gets into the car with you. He wants to relax at home. Any child, no matter how fabulous the school, has to walk around with armor. He does. Every kid, boy or girl, walks around with a sort of an armor of how to get through the day. If your home is a healthy one, an emotionally healthy one, when they're at your house, when they're in the room, when they're in your car, they want to take that armor off. So you ask them all these questions, it makes them think about it, and you sort of put it all on. So how are you going to talk to him? So you do that thing in the car, hey, what's up? That's it, get home, just be chill, it's all good, be silent, 
your child might think that I have a feeling right now that there are boys around the country that are very confused because, I, because I've been talking about this for a week and I have this like, what are the boys supposed to be getting in the car being like, what's going on? I don't understand what's going on. Why is this person not talking to me? <laughs> All right. But if you do want to talk to your child and you do want to know what's going on, which is totally reasonable, what I would say, what I would suggest to you is I want you to think about what works for your child. So I'll tell you what works for my, mine. Works for mine is I come in at about 9.30, quarter to 10, when my 12-year-old, when they're both going to bed, and I, their you know, lights are off, or one light is on, but really it's better if the lights are off, and you sit at the bottom of the bed, the foot of the bed, and you say, hey, like, what's up? That's it. Like, if there's something specific you want to ask, like, I know that, I know you were working on that history thing, was that okay today? Not, how did you do? I know that you were working on that history thing, like, was that okay? How'd it go? The thing that you don't, the reason that darkness is very good for uh, both boys and for girls is that they are so reactive to our facial expressions that being in the dark is very helpful. Because my older son in particular, if I sigh or if I move my eyebrow, immediately gets in my face about I'm accusing him of things, I'm being totally unreasonable, I play, and I'm like, I, no, right? But you know what? He's right. He's right. If I sigh or move my eyebrow, I am irritated at him. I'm just trying to get it under control. So he's right. So the dark is good. The other thing you can do is you're playing, and you know, you guys know this. Is my, my older kid plays basketball. Um, he's also six feet one and 175 pounds and not weak. So I can't play what I want with him anymore, but I can throw him the basketball and he can, while he's practicing, he's shy. And we can have very deep conversations while he's doing that. So every kid is different. Like one of my kids likes to do target practice with like, if you know, like a BB gun kind of thing. I sat next to him while he was doing that. We were loading up the little pellets. Talk to him while he was doing that. Not long, in-depth conversations, but just little ones. Because it's the little ones, if we're able to have it, that give him the confidence that if there's something that's really running off the rails, he can go talk to you and he will not freak out. Because that's what they don't want. The other thing that I found very helpful, that's like the, one of the foundation points. The other foundation point is when you are aggravated at your children. Because you need, it's very important to me that we have ethical authority with our kids. We're taking it seriously. So if you're really mad at your child, so for example, my younger one, honest to God, honest to God, walks into my house and every single day takes off at least his disgusting socks and leaves them at some point around the house. It's disgusting. 57 times I have asked him to pick up the socks, right? So I don't feel listened to, or I don't feel listened to about the video games because I've talked to him over and over again. I mean, we've been very clear about certain things and I feel like I cannot believe we're talking about this. So what I have found that's very helpful is this strategy. Before you go, get, before you have, you communicate with your son about what you're frustrated about, and again, this would work with girls, is that you have three points that you are going to make, three points. You will make these three points no matter what happens. And what I mean by no matter what happens is our children are so good at pushing our buttons so we get distracted and annoyed and totally lose control. So you get three points, you will say these three points. You will say them in approximately three minutes and you will not repeat yourself. If you hear yourself doing that, you stop because they will not listen to you when you're repeating yourself. And I have made that mistake over and over and over and over again. Where I'm talking to my kid, I'm saying the same thing to him five times. He's not listening to one word I'm saying. Not one. So three points, three minutes, don't repeat yourself. So there's, those are the building blocks, strangely enough, that allows your child, when they're upset, to come to you when they're having a problem. So now I'm going to go into what happens when they're having a problem. Okay. Okay. Your child comes to you and says, these kids are bothering me. Swim shirt. The kids bother, they were bothering me at the pool. <coughs> so I would suggest that you say something like this, if it's super general at first. I would say, well, I'm not really, I, I don't know what you mean by bothering me. Can you be a little bit more specific so I have a better idea of what you're talking about? Because bothering, that word, like they're teasing me, they're bothering me, 
is so general and they're sort of seeing what you're going to say. But you need to have more information because in the absence of information, most adults will say something like, that's what kids do. Those are your friends, like what do you mean by that? Like, but in a more accusatory, like what's going on? I don't or they'll blow it off. So just, I would suggest say, you know what, I really, I don't understand what that means. Can you tell me what that means? Can you describe it for me? What are they doing? So when your child says to you what they're doing that's really upsetting, what I suggest that you say is something like, I'm really sorry that happened, thank you for telling me, and together we're gonna work on this. Those three things, you don't have to do them in the perfect order, just try and get those three points across. I'm so sorry that happened to you, thank you for telling me, together we're gonna work on this. Now your son might say, mom, dad, I'm gonna tell you this, but you can't do anything about it. If that happens to you, I want you to say something like this. I'm I, I would love to make this promise. I would love to make this promise to you. But I can't because you might tell me something that I don't know what the answer is. I don't know what to do. We might have to find somebody else who can help us think it through. So I don't want to make promises I can't keep. This is very important to boys. <coughs> you don't want to make promises you cannot keep. And if you do that, you better own it. And, I, and own it by not saying things like, People, I'm only human, but please hear me about this because the boys were adamant about it from fourth grade to 12th grade. That when we make mistakes as adults, that we do not own our mistakes by saying, people make mistakes. What they want to hear from you is, when it's appropriate, is I am sorry, I made a mistake. The boys are onto us about this. And boy, do they hear in the outside world all sorts of adults, hypocritical, ridiculous adults, who are supposed to be leaders, who make stupid apologies that absolutely don't take responsibility for their own behavior. So the least thing that they want is to hear from people in their own lives. And that is really pretty fair, I would say. So say, I am sorry, I made a mistake. So you don't want to make a mistake, you don't want to make promises you can't keep. So when your kid says, I want to say, I want to tell this to you, but I don't want you to do anything about it. You say, I'm really, I, I would like to make that promise, I can't, but I will promise to you that if we have to bring somebody else in, if we have to think about this with somebody else, you will know. I'm not gonna blindside you, I am not gonna surprise you. Because in my experience with boys and girls is that they can deal with us being adults if we include them in the process. When they stop talking to us is when we take away their agency, when we take away their the, any uh, sense of control in their lives, which again, is only fair. So one of the ways that can be really helpful to distinguish the problem you've got in front of you is to distinguish for, the, for this child the difference between good teasing, ignorant teasing, and malicious teasing. So here's the difference. The good teasing is you feel light. They don't, the person, you don't feel the person wants to put you down, and they're gonna stop if you ask. Boys in a group can say the most outrageously rude things to each other. I mean, really, like so bad, so bad. Like they can even talk about their mothers and stuff. I mean, it's really, like, bad. <laughs> so if there's a democracy of put downs, you're good. That's what the boys like decided. If there was a democracy of put downs, everybody can put down everybody else, you're good. Ignorant teasing that the person who's doing it doesn't know how you feel, target feels, or, and they say things like, I was just joking, relax, but they're not trying to make you feel bad about it, even if they are, they're not trying to make you feel bad. Malicious teasing is your tease for your insecurities, you're up to, if you try and complain about it, you're accused of being uptight or with, uh, and being with threatened with ending the friendship, and it is relentless and it is in public. So you go back to the swim, situation and just add in the fact what if girls were there after now I just gave you a little thing with all the boys were there what if all the what if the girls were there as well and that's and that happened as well I mean just a map just really put your 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 head in the space of a seventh grade kid who is right about to go through puberty who has you know these little boobs that sometimes boys have and he gets out of the pool and there are four girls standing in his, like a circle giggling about something God knows what they're doing and his friend makes fun of him about this. I mean, think about that. We are so focused on girls and the relational aggression and the teasing that they're doing that we do not credit how painful that could be for a boy. So that is clearly relentless, it is in public, it is specifically about something that he is insecure about. 
So what is he going to do? So what happens is, your son, you, know, you go through all the stuff with him. I'm so sorry. Thank you for telling me to work, work on it. You go, you find out what the problem is because you're using like explain to me what exactly is happening. Let's look at this. So this is for younger boys, right? About like you know, or they can. This is the cool. This is what's so awesome about the guy. The guy has exactly the same information in it, so the boy can look on his own without having to look at your book or look at anything about this. He can go and do that on his own, so he doesn't have to get embarrassed. He's sitting there with you, so he can figure this out. What is he going to do about it? Well, we want parents to be a bridge of support. We want them to be able to provide guidance and also to be able to give their kids this feeling of, this is difficult, this is messy, but I'm behind you and I'm supporting you every step of the way to think this through. And if it gets too much for you, so it's distracting you from your schoolwork, you can't get stuff done, then we'll take it to the next level, we'll deal with it, but let's just try and settle this down so we can step by step go through the process. So here's the next step. Here are two boys. Now, the boy in the black has been dealing with, he was the kid at the swim party who didn't like what was happening and swam away. The kid in the white is the mastermind, is the one that's been relentless, he's the one that's been relentlessly teaching your son about being boo boy. Now, these kids have been friends for a long time and their parents are friends, which makes it really tricky, by the way, for the boys, because they know how tricky this is for you. So if your son is in the black, let's just say your son's the bystander now, and he comes to you and talks to you about this, you're going to say exactly the same thing, or a variation on the theme. But I want you to think about that boys can have actually very good conversations with each other while they are playing Call of Duty. <laughs> they can't. These people are not playing Minecraft, can we be clear? <laughs> not playing Minecraft. These boys, for the most part, I would bet a zillion dollars but they don't like playing Minecraft, okay? They're playing Call of Duty, they're playing Halo, or they're playing NBA 2K or Madden or something like that. Now, they can have these conversations, talking to each other, playing video games. The boys have said to me that they like doing this, they can do it playing video games, after practice is a good time, they're like, or walking back from school with just the two of them. These are gonna be short, short conversations that, they are, that the kid's gonna ease in and ease out of. But in order to do that, they have to prepare. And so what, they're, what this is your, our role, to whatever extent we can, is to help them understand the fundamentals of the conversation when we're speaking truth to power. So the first step is, is thinking about where are you gonna confront the person? And this is one of the best places to confront the kid. So you're gonna say, the kid is a bystander, like little variation on the theme, Thank you for telling me because I know it can come forward. I think it'd be hard to come forward about things like this. And I really respect the fact that you did. Dads, you saying that you really respect the fact that they came forward is humongous for these boys to hear that true, confident men who are proud of their masculinity, who are honorable men, strong men, confident men, respect when somebody comes forward to make something better. Now I want to go back, this might seem so strange to you, but go back to the very beginning when I told you about those girls in the hallway. They had no problem claiming, we want to contribute to this. Meanwhile, most of the boys are secretly tweeting at me. We have to get boys to a place where they feel that they can claim wanting to make the world a better place. And in this moment right here, this kid, man in the room, if you can, as in your relationship with boys, claim that strong, confident men claim passion to make the world a better place, we will do some pretty amazing stuff. Then the conversation changes. And we have to be able to be clear with the boys about the difference between snitching and reporting. So this is the way I define it. Snitching is telling to get somebody in trouble, and the goal is to make the problem bigger and more public. And reporting is telling you the problem is too big for you to solve on your own, and you want to right a wrong. The goal is to right a wrong. Completely different motivations. So our job as the adults is to be able to clarify the difference. So let's go back to the boys in the game. You sit down with your son, or maybe he has the guy 
and you read about it, and then maybe you come together and you can say to your son, read that. If you read that part and see if that woman and those boys are completely wrong, right? That's the way I would like. It, she might be completely wrong. Maybe those boys are completely wrong. But read it and come back and tell me why. So here's the strategy, because you want to start a discussion with your kid. So here's the strategy that I would ask you to think about to do with your son. So Mark decides, Mark's going to say exactly what he doesn't like. You said, what is it exactly that you didn't like that happened at the swim party? Your son has to put words to the feeling in his stomach that made him swim away. Well, taking those pictures of Michael, calling him boot boy, forwarding him to the girl that he liked, was messed up. That's exactly what's happening he doesn't like. One of the things that's the most fun for boys to do is when you ask your son, again, ask your daughter too, when you're going to confront somebody, they're not going to agree with you at all. They're going to say something that's totally annoying or to distract you or get you defensive. So that's called a pushback. What do you think is the most likely thing this kid's going to do to push back? So most kids love doing the pushback, like coming up with the pushback. So here's one. No, it wasn't. It was amazing. Next, Mark is saying, sort of stating what is happening. Actually, no, he was really mad. Here's the next pushback. No, I don't. And if he was so freaked out, why didn't he say anything? In fact, you know, one of the things we need to ask as for adults to kids is, why don't people say anything? Now, your child knows the answer sitting in your kitchen table. You all know the answer. But it needs to be said in a quiet place. Because oftentimes what we do is blame people for being silent or waiting and waiting and waiting, and then all of a sudden, like, just exploding and being really upset. <laughs> so, this is, you're speaking the truth. You're, uh, you're enlightening your kid or talking about this with your kid, because then you would have made fun of him even more. It's not my fault he's so weak, and I wouldn't have cared if he'd done it to me. And you laugh just as much as I did. So this is the best and most common example of this whole thing about girls being the ones who are relationally aggressive and boys are not is ridiculous. Boys are extremely complex about the way they manipulate each other. So this is this kid, and he's saying, it's not my fault, he can't take it. I wouldn't have cared if it happened to me. It didn't happen to him. He doesn't, he can't, has no credibility to talk about that. The other part is, even if it wouldn't have bothered him, it doesn't matter. Because everybody has the right to define their own experiences. And one of the most important things parents can say to their kids is, you do not have the right to say what happened to that other kid. You don't. Just like somebody doesn't have the right to say that about you, you don't have the right to say they just took it the wrong way, they're being overly sensitive. Nobody gets to do that, nobody should be able to do that to anybody else. And Andy is being incredibly smart by saying, you can't say anything to me about this because you laugh, which means you're just as guilty as I am. One of the things I would ask you to think about talking to your sons and your daughters is that because they laugh doesn't mean they can't go back and fix it later. Because that's what a lot of people think, is I can't, if I laughed, I can't do it because it looks like I was guilty. So here's what your kid can say. I'm not proud of this, but I laughed because I was nervous. All I'm asking is that you lay off. And Andy says, fine, I'll back off. But you do realize how gay you're being about this whole thing, right? <laughs> you are not going to get a kid to say, you're so right, I will stop doing this. <laughs> and then Mark says, right, I'm gay because I want you to stop making a kid miserable, whatever. And they go back to the game. Now this is the most complicated conversation. This is the ideal situation. And this is not, but this is what's going to happen in real life. There is no expectation that this is what's going to happen in real life. You prepare, you do really, you try your best, and in real life, you, you do as much as you can, and any part of this that you do is a success. Now, if you go through this with your son, he's like a cooperative person with this, which some of you probably, you know, some people will have cooperative children with this and they want to go through this. Some will not. But if you have a child and you know that he's going through this and trying to do this, or you've gone through this with him, and you drop him off at school the next day, and you know he's going to be hanging out with Andy, and you pick him up from school at the end of the day, do not look at him with that weird look of like, did you talk to Andy? <laughs> do not do this. That's not cool. You 
just do the same thing because he's watching to see if you're going to say something. There is, don't put any pressure on this kid at all. He gets in the car, you say, hey, what's up? Later that night, you say, hey, did, you know, what, did anything happen? How did, how did it go? No darkness. No faces. Okay? No faces. All right. Now, I'm going to give you one more sort of piece of, of suggestion about how to deal with conflict. And then what I want you to do is we're going to have you know, uh, questions that you can ask me or comments. You know, there are people of many different kinds of ages of boys here. I can talk about playgrounds. I can talk about parties. I can talk about the horrible things we've seen in the news. No problem talking about anything in between. I want to be able to be responsive to what you need, and also that when you walk out of here, you feel like this has been a useful, useful use, uh, a good use of your time. And I'm also going to ask um, somebody who's working with me to come up here to uh, not only help you and talk to you about sort of this pro this idea, this campaign, this movement that we're trying to do. But also that you can, um, he might be able to help also with, with any of the questions that you have. So here's what happens if you get information that your child has done something wrong. I have had this happen to me many times. Believe me, many, many times. Um, I said in Masterminds, and I, it was really embarrassing to write this, but it's true, and I believe you guys say it's true within limits, is, um, you know, I got a phone call once. Um, from, and I was on a plane. I remember this like it was yesterday. I got a phone call. It was sort of a bad phase we were going through. And I got a phone call from the principal. And I looked at it. And I just went, ignore. Because <laughs> I didn't want to, I didn't, I didn't want to hear. I was like, she'll call my husband. <laughs> I just can't deal with one more thing of what my child <clears throat> has done today. I just can't do it right now. I don't want to hear it. I don't want to hear it. We have these moments where we are human beings, and we have to go, you know, when I landed, of course, I called her, and I called my husband, and all that, but at that moment, I just couldn't deal. So, you know, you get these bad news bombs, and what happens is that you really question someone's sanity, or I do. I question my child's sanity, I question the person who's telling me, I question my own sanity, I question anybody's sanity. It is so, it's like, what is going on? What is going on? So here's how I would suggest you manage your response when you get problematic information. Number one is, I want you to remember that this is not a, this is not a lifetime. This is a moment. Okay? Your child is not destined to be some horrible, horrible person or some horrible bully or some horrible mastermind for the rest of his life when you get information that is problematic. Two, do not make excuses for him. I mean it. Like when kids are little, Remember the whole thing like, oh, he's overtired, he's oversugared, that's why he's acting so horrible. Can we just not say that, please? Just, you know, our kids are our kids. It's a, sometimes they act badly. So don't make excuses. I want you to ask for what you need. So in that situation, when somebody tells you problematic stuff, my experience is that my heart rates, my heart, goes really, really fast. And it really goes fast and the person's really mad at me, feel like they're screaming at me. Um, I had one person come up to me at a, soccer, at a soccer field and they were moving fast in that way that moms move fast and they are going for somebody. And I was hoping she was like going for somebody else. And I, but it was right at me. And, um, and she talked so fast and she was so angry that I could not hear a word she said. And I had to say to her, because I didn't know her name, I said, like, my child was throwing rocks in her child's general vicinity. And I, he might have been doing it on purpose. I absolutely, well, granted, it could have happened. So she's coming up to me. That was my little one, my younger one. Just so we know that we're equal opportunity in my family. It's not, right? Okay, so she's coming up with me. She is furious. My heart is racing. I can't understand her. So what I say to her is, ma'am, I really do want to understand what you're saying. But the way you're yelling at me, I, like my heart is beating out of my chest. So can you just slow down? Because I really want to hear you. I do want to listen to you. I do want to hear it. I just can't. So if somebody is screaming at you, cussing you out, all that stuff, what I would say, you know, is something like what I said that's true to you, <clears throat> which is basically the way you're talking to me right now. I can't hear you, and I really do want to hear you. All right, now 
How do you diffuse the situation with your own child? So what I would do is I would say, and I have done, is I would say, okay, X was reported to me. Is that accurate? You're gonna see what they said. If they say any of it is accurate, then you are within your rights as a parent, actually your responsibility as a parent, is to say, well, that's that child's experiences, so that's true, you can't take away from that. But if your child says, no way, none of it is true, they're completely out of their mind, you are going to say something like, if the person was sitting right here and they wanted to convince me that you were wrong, what would they say? Because if you have very verbal children, like people, if you have children that you think that you're like laughing but not laughing and sort of like, ugh, like they're gonna be a lawyer one day, if this child will advocate the other position. If you say, that person wants to, you wanna, you convince me, like pretend that you're the other kid, convince me. So you can try that as a suggestion. The other thing I would do is I would reiterate, like strategically, that everybody has equal rights about treat, being treated with dignity. So while your child has the, respons has the responsibility to treat others with dignity, they have the right. And the other thing is, is that their they, your child could have done some stuff that's really a problem. You're talking to your child. They are saying they're telling you things about what the other child did. I would say, okay. That's a problem. What that child did is a problem, and we will address that later. But it does not take away from the reason that I'm talking to you right now. So don't let that happen. Don't get to the place of like, he did that to you? Are you kidding me? And then go call the administrator and say, well, you don't know the whole story, and start doing that kind of stuff. Please don't do that. And please do not send that in an email with like all capitals or like subcapitals. <laughs> please do not do that. Because I get these emails sometimes, and really the only thing I think is this person has lost their mind. They are not going to be able to listen to a word anybody says to that. So remember that if you get that, say, you know what? What's important, what happened to you is important, but it doesn't take away from why we're here. Here is also something that I would say if you've got a kid that you're really concerned about, they're sort of on the long road to being decent human beings, and it's going to might take a while, and it's okay. These are the moments they really put them on the right track. So I would suggest saying something to him like, if the life of the target, the life of the kid we're talking about, gets more, if the life of that person gets more difficult as a result of this conversation, you're gonna, face, you're gonna force me, your actions force me to take additional consequences. So this addresses from the perpetrator or tormentor's point of view for the parents, how parents can help the fear that boys and girls have about if I come forward, my life will be worse. Because what happens is that the perpetrator gets on the phone in two seconds or starts texting or whatever they're doing and says, my mom, and they totally do hyperbole, right? You could have had the most calm conversation and they will tell their friends you completely freaked out on them and their entire life is completely miserable because of what they did to you. Meanwhile, you've had a conversation, all right? So, I really, really strongly, strongly, strongly am asking you that you say to your kids some version that feels right to you, if the life of the target becomes more difficult as a result of our conversation right here, I gotta take more serious I gotta take more serious consequences with you because revenge is not justified in our family. It's not. It's, it's against what our family values stand for. Alright, now with that, I think we're yeah, we're good. Okay. Is I'm going to have you think about your questions. And I'm also going to ask um, someone named Charlie Coon to come up here with me. And as he walks up here, I'm going to tell you why he's here. Um, so I have these 200 guys, no, 160 guys, 40 girls. I always had young men or men in their 20s who are helping me as bridge editors. So when I, I lived in Washington, D.C. until about 14, 16, whatever, a year and some ago. And I moved to Boulder, Colorado. Um, and yes, our basement is actually there. It's, it's getting there. We had 4,000 gallons of water in our basement um, last. When I came back from my first week of the tour, it was awesome. Um, if you go to my Facebook page, you can see my husband in honest to God in his wetsuit going into our basement. Um, but so I always had been in their 20s. When I first moved to Boulder, I was looking for someone to help me as one of these bridge editors. And so I found Charlie, and he worked with me part-time. Um, and he was working full-time in another job. And then in June, I convinced him to work with me full-time. 
And his job is to really create the momentum between the boys to share the guide around the country. Because really, as far as I can tell, and the counselor told me this this afternoon, this evening when I got here, I don't know if there's another guide the way that we did it with the boys that is also an ebook that is also being delivered to the boys for free. And so it is extremely important to me that young men are working with men, adult men, and with younger teen boys to be able to do this together so that they all have ownership. So, Charlie? Yeah, so very proud to announce that we have a book for your sons to read. It's, again, not something that we encourage you to go home and be really excited about. The guy push your tail saying, I know what's in your brain. <laughs> um, and one of the last things that we did in Mastermind was write a letter to you. Um, unfortunately, we put it in the back of the book and it probably should have been right up front. Um, but if you turn to the last page, you'll see a letter to how you can talk to your sons about this book. It can be found on Amazon or iTunes or any of those e-reader platforms. And really, it was written for boys, by boys. So all of these guys helped write masterminds as well as this guy. So it's out there. I think the way that it'll get two boys is from parents like you who are encouraged to go and join talks like this, be a part of their lives. Another way is through peer-to-peer -peer sharing. So if there's peer teaching groups, and even the sports teams. Like, there's a number of ways that we're going about getting this, or getting it out there, um, but it really is the beginning of an experiment and a movement. So inviting you all to be a part of it, and let's see if we can change how guys interact with each other. And with you. And so with that, I want to get, I'm going to ask Charlie to stay up here, because it's nice to have somebody who is the demographic up here, since I clearly am not. So. Um, those of you who have questions, comments, we have one, we have one, um, uh, what's it called, microphone over here. Gilda is going, Gilda will be in charge. <laughs> Gilda will be in charge. So if you have questions or comments, this is a good time to ask me. And remember, you can do, you can ask us, both of us, anything with any age range. Yes, I think it's on. These people are on it, Gilda, I wouldn't worry. You had a bad news bomb this morning? No, last week. Test, test, test. You got it. You got it. And as punishment for what had transpired, uh, we confiscated our kids' home and also some ground. So now I had his home. Ah? And I went through his home and found out a bunch of other stuff. How old is he? He's 16. Okay. He didn't have a he didn't have a, a lock on his phone that you didn't know. No lock. <laughs> or he didn't have I don't know. He he had to hand it over immediately. Oh. So there was no time to lock. Oh, that was such a bad mistake on his part. <laughs> <laughs> he must have been like, can you? I just need to go to the bathroom really badly. Can I just take my phone? <laughs> can you imagine? So uh, now we have a lot of other information that was a surprise to us. Sorry, I'm sorry. Yeah, that's okay. Yeah. And, um, but I don't know that I should ground a kid or, 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 or even get into it because I invaded his privacy. Ah, gotcha. And okay. I want to respect that. Yeah, sure. He, he got <laughs> caught for something. Yeah. Uh, we've addressed it. Yeah. Uh, I don't know that I should pursue. And what about this? I, I, thought, I saw that you were doing this with this yeah. guy. And we, Dad and I, not cool. Yeah, social, got it. It's a social media thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you want to start? I, I can say that the same situation happened in my family with my younger brother. Um, my parents went down the road of making it a bigger problem. In some ways, I think it should taught him that all of his actions have consequences. At the same time, I was told for him not to get the full house thrown on it. But it, it really depends on how serious you think these problems are, and if these are habits, and that something will continue to happen in a certain way, and also the friend groups that he's running with. All right, yeah, I completely agree with him. And the other part is, my thinking changed, by the way, about social networking and privacy um, in the last couple of years. So in general, I think, and the boys and I talked about this a lot, that they felt in middle school it was absolutely appropriate for parents to have supervision over the boys' phones. And let me back up a second about the phones, before we get to the phones. 
people stress on the phones and Facebook, if any of your children are online playing video games, their social norming about what is appropriate behavior when you're angry at somebody or when you're, you're just, you want to go, you're just, you know, how you go after people happens on the video games with the social, with the social networking that's happening on the video games. So that by, by that time, if you, they are using a phone, those social norms have probably been set which means when you're angry at somebody, then you think you can call somebody, excuse my language, a pussy, a faggot, a whore, or, you know, whatever. All of those things are happening online at about the age of 10 with kids. Like Call of Duty, any of those things, if they're playing online, it actually doesn't even matter about Call of Duty. It could be Mario Kart, for goodness sakes. So that social norming is happening then. So let's fast forward to the phones. The boys are saying that they think, and I agree, that the privacy, that you need to know their, their passwords, and then you can look when you want to see that they're establishing these norms that you agree with. That said, my older child is constantly changing the lock on his phone, constantly. So I am constantly saying to him, give me that phone and tell me what that password is. And by the way, and constantly I am saying to him, you cannot charge your phone in the room because you, know, you can't use it as an alarm. I'm taking it as being charged in my room. I don't trust it in the kitchen anymore. In the last book, I said, charge him in the kitchen. I have a 12 year old now. It's in my room. It's next to my, not my head, but like it is really, he can't get it. He cannot sneak in. So middle school, that's what I'm doing. My high school, the 16 year old, what I would do is, I, would, I so agree with Charlie about it. There are patterns of behavior where he is humiliating or degrading other people. Then I think that what I would do is I would say to him, I really need to talk to you about something that's really uncomfortable for me. I took the phone, and he's going to know, he's probably stressed, he's been stressing about this <laughs> since you took the phone, and say, you know, I saw this, there was no, you know, because there was no, <laughs> no lock on the phone, um, and this is, what it, this is what it comes across to me. This is what comes across, and he's going to say something like, Mom, it doesn't matter, we're just joking, whatever. I would say, if you're saying words like, you're seeing those kinds of words, you using those words to put people down, faggot, whore, or whatever, is against what I stand for. I can't stop you from doing this on this phone, but I'm telling you that that's what I stand for. You're 16, you're getting older, I'm asking you to think about that. Give him that this is what I stand for, and I, I know that I can't control the entire situation, but I'm holding you to a higher standard. I think that that works much better than um, I'm taking away the phone, I cannot believe you did this, all of those kinds of things. Including, by the way, if you got like a sexy picture from somebody and you're like, whoa, right? Or if you see that he's got like many pictures, sort of like of collecting baseball cards kind of thing, you're like, oh my God, what is wrong with my job, right? If you see those kinds of things, say, look, this is why this bothers me. This is important to me. You need to make the choice this is a responsibility that you have, this thing, this gadget, but I need you to understand why this is against my family values. Because if you don't, if you don't say this straightforward, you know, even you can take away, as Charlie said, the whole house can come down on him, but he can continue to do those things in many other kinds of ways. So this is really about the relationship that you have with him. Does that make sense? Okay. Other questions? Gilda, you're on. Before we move on. Oh, this is a big issue. Yeah. Uh, you may be hitting on some other things, like his behavior and what he's planning to do. Oh, yeah. In the evenings. <laughs> this is why we have to have young men up here. <laughs> I think the latter half of what her advice is, is the, the behavior and the, the family values really resonates with the boy, of why you don't want to participate in activities that you're not proud of later, and if there are larger goals that he's trying to achieve. Approaching you from that may be a different thing bullying somebody on your phone. I think it might be more of how do we plan on, what are we planning on doing, and how are we going to do this? Gilda, you're on. Hi. Hi. How do we approach our children to, um, to be aware of the violence in the world, of with a lot of aggressive behaviors with these kids at the video games, and just hanging on to stress for so many years? Because a lot of the, the crimes are perpetrated by young people. Males, yeah, white males, yeah, that's true. Um, I think what I want you to do is I've spent some amount of time with these with the masterminds about explaining the context the boys are growing up in, 
And I think that what we've got is a real dearth or a gap that I want to encourage the men in the boys' lives and the women. There's two things I want to stress. One is I want women to take responsibility for their authority with their boys. I want mothers to be respected by their sons. They can love us, they can care for us, that's nice, that's great, very important. I want them respecting us. And I go into great detail about why I think we're running off the rails that way. And I'll just give one snippet, which is I think sometimes moms get caught, and this is a lot of what I've done with women and written about, is that we think that in order to maintain a relationship, that especially with boys that we love, our sons, that they get to treat us however they want because it's more important. We don't, we're worried that if we stand our ground with them, they will leave us. And what I know from the boys is that they will leave us psychologically, they will lose respect for us if we do not hold our ground with them. That is actually one of the most important things for the boys to be able to feel safe in this world, is having a mother that they respect. And for men, having men in their lives, fathers or some man in their life, because many people are being raised without, without men, without fathers, but coaches can do this, uncles can do this, people in the neighborhood can do this, where men are saying to boys, and having conversations with boys about the importance of relationships and the importance of you know saying things like I mean this is crazy in response to maybe in response to your video game question which is a, a guy saying to a boy they're watching TV and maybe something comes up about romance or something and the boy, guy says to the boy oh my gosh when I was your age I had the most intense crush on somebody like she couldn't even walk in the door and I couldn't breathe you know, and the kid's like, this could be completely, like, not germane to anything, you know, like, just talk about it. Like, wow, this totally happened to me, it was totally embarrassing, or, oh, my heart got broken, it made me so angry, my friend betrayed me with a girl. Those kinds of things are imperative for boys to hear from men that they respect. It's the complexity of their relationships that men, that boys want to hear so they can offset the violence and the aggression that they're constantly getting from the outside world. Really? <laughs> Next question. Hi. My 17-year-old um, senior wants this game called Grand Theft Auto V. Because the new one's out. And I read the reviews, and it's not part of our family bill. Right. And he claims that everybody he knows that he's 12 years old, and including my sister's son, has it. Yeah. And I'm being ridiculous. And He's old enough to buy sleep himself. He drives, and he doesn't want to have to sleep at home. He's telling me he's getting it. So, oh, he's pushing your butt. And he's okay. Saying, <laughs> you know, not doing this, this, and this. He's, you know, this is his like vice. So, why am I being so unreasonable? What do I Yeah. So, I think that video game is, is is tough for a number of reasons. I think one thing that we're also going to get into in a deeper way that I can is the, the reflection of the characters that the, that the company is putting forward. Um, but I'll take this from another point of view that as, as fun as video games can be, they can also be quite therapeutic. And I think we hit on it at the beginning with the, the Moogs story, the boy who came home and had no way of getting any sort of release out besides screaming or yelling. And those aren't appropriate. Those aren't the ways that he can handle those frustrations. Video games allow him to get out some of these angers in a more productive way. And I know it might seem crazy, but it is a, it is a strategic game that has goals, that has a grand goal, but you also are attack, you know, tackling this grand goal with little projects in between. So again, it's, it's, a, it's a funny way to go about the answer, but there are therapeutic ways uh, to, to look at video games. Now, Grand Theft Auto, in particular, has a history of being incredibly misogynistic and, by, and condoning the violence against women. More also to the gaming community is there are no interesting female characters in uh, Grand Theft Auto. Um, plus, you're getting worked because he's doing the classic thing of everybody's getting it. Ridiculous. Which, really, you just need to say to him, what is the point of that? There's no point in you telling me that. I don't care. And if you're saying, well, I can just go over to somebody's house. Duh. Yes, of course you can. All kids can do that. Absolutely. So what this is about is if you don't want that game in your house, it's your house. Don't have Grand Theft Auto. I don't care what he says about that. It's not, it's the deal. 
there's other games that he can play that are violent, that are not completely condoning of violence against women. Mm -hmm. So if you want to, you know, say, if you, but I think he needs to be educated. You can say, like, one, here's what I would do. I would also educate yourself about Grand Theft Auto and look at, because there's tons of articles right now about Grand Theft Auto um, and about the characters and the women and stuff like that. So I would say, well, I read this stuff. I would say exactly understand what Charlie is saying about the therapeutic nature sometimes of these games. Um, but say this particular game, this is what I did. I did the research. This is what I think. This is why I have a problem with it. And that's why it's not coming into the house. Yes, I know you can go and do it elsewhere, but not in this house. So it's a combination of the things that Charlie and I are telling you. All right, one more question, Gilda. Are we good? I can't tell you how many times my mom just straight up said, I'm the meanest mom in the whole wide world, and you deal with it. <laughs> that, and that was that. Uh, if they're happy with you 24 7, 365, you're probably not doing the job. Right, right. Okay. Hi. So, um, my son, seventh grader, 12 years old, smaller guy, um, is getting bullied. And it's been happening this week to the point where the boy hit him on the top of the head. And so, my husband says, Hit you again, you hit back. I, may, I disagree. How would you suggest we handle that? Okay. So, this is why we wrote the guide. This is exactly the reason why. So, in the parents' book, it's frontal assault. I think it's a chapter called frontal assault. In both. But isn't it called like, the right to fight? No? Okay. In both chapters, both books, it's frontal assault. I think one of the, most, the things that we've done in schools that have been, remember I said at the very beginning, I wasn't giving good advice to boys. One of the things that we do in education because we feel trapped, is we say, violence is never the answer, right? And the boy looks at you and is like, really? <laughs> because that kid is making this being violent to me, and it's working quite well for him. So, right? So, I went into great detail about this in the final assault chapter. I think that um, what I don't want is for parents to be a non-united split front about this, where the mom says, usually, in this case, you would be, you know, emblematic of that. I don't want you doing that. That's not appropriate. And the dad says, actually, you just need to hit him really hard, right? <laughs> so if you get in trouble, at least you, okay. Um, this issue of, of fighting is extremely complicated. It's not simple. It's violence is not the answer is not actually the answer. It is about your child figuring out, first of all, is there a person in the school that is worthy and is smart enough and competent enough that your child can work within the system to solve the problem. And that is a skill. So it's not just, I'm gonna go to the counselor, or I'm gonna, it is your child sitting down and saying, who is the person in this school that you think is smart enough and competent enough that you can go and use exactly the same sort of strategy I just talked about? What do you not like? What do you want? Um, what do you need to be safe in the school? The kid writes it down, you write an email to the, to, to the principal, to the person, and said, we're having this problem, we need some help, when can we meet with you? That's a four sentence paragraph. Your child walks in with a piece of paper so they can communicate that, but they lose their words. You are in the back, ready to support him, but you are not speaking for him, because this is a way for him to get his own self-agency. So if the school cannot handle this and it's getting worse, the thing that I say to boys, and this is a messy answer, and you know, I, but I think that we've gotta be honest with boys is, if you fight back, you have to have very strict rules about what that looks like, what, how far, like, what will happen, you have to be okay with the consequences that will happen to you from the school and from, as boys get older, the judicial system, so that they're not, it's not, it's not a guy saying, just fight back. That's not responsible for a, a, a parent to say, just fight back, because there are things that happen in a school as a result of that. So your child needs to be able to understand that before he goes through this actually somewhat complex situation. So it's not as easy as never fight back, punch him in the face. It is understanding the situation, trying to get the kid to go work through the problem with the system, and then having the kid have a serious, like, a serious conversation about is he really threatened? Is he physically threatened? Um, and the last part is I really feel like, and you're not saying that you are, but if a kid cannot be at school and is exhausted, the avenues and, work, and working with the people who are supposed to keep him safe, and they cannot do that, then he should not be at that school. Going back to the right to fight, I think that, that there really are strict guidelines of how you go about that. 
understanding both internally, what that means to yourself, standing up for whatever you think is best, and more importantly, what she touched on, how you work within the institutions that you're a part of. That's your family's home, that's your school, and it can oftentimes be the police or some sort of powers that be. So, and I think that, that going through that process will either allow him to stand up and use violence, or go about one of these other avenues to tackle this, to tackle this issue. But it's, it's not a bad thing to swim if you need to. So, yeah, we, um, I want to, so that's messy. That's a great example of our lives are messy. And I, my thinking has changed about this. Um, that's, that's actually not true. My thinking has not changed about this particular issue. I'm just being more honest about it than I have in the past. So, well, this is the, but it's a really good way to end on, before I give it back to Gilda, is that we can tackle these messy problems. That's a problem that does not, it's like, ugh, that doesn't feel like the right answer, right? We're supposed to give these right, clean answers. It is okay to acknowledge the messiness of our lives. And so I want you to think about, as you go and hopefully talk about this with your sons and follow our directions if you want about the guide, is to really think about how you are going to transform the relationship that you have with the boys in your life. So thank you very much.